thing is that I actually I had such five a good time. Minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. No, it's going to be really brief. Here's the thing. Russ Taylor started his career at Johns Hopkins University. He was a stellar engineer and he went on to get his PhD at that other university down the, down the peninsula. When he was with Rujana and a number of major leaders that went on to become, uh, to become the real founders of the field of, of robotics and, and AI. And he was then, and he also wrote papers with Jerry Feldman, who's here, and many other scholars. So he's really, and, and, and my advisor, Matt Mason, uh, they, they collaborated very early on. And Matt, uh, they, Russ moved to, to IBM, where he basically built up their robotics division and was hugely influential there with, their, with, with a language that was being that the IBM adopted for all of their robotic systems. He then wrote a paper that is still widely cited to this day called um, the automatic synthesis of fine motion strategies with Lozano Perez, Mason and Taylor, the ML LMT classic paper, which I still recommend to all my yes, students. Yes, yes. He went on to then become a, uh, a, a, a huge success at IBM and led their, their foray into, uh, into robotic surgery an orthopedic surgery, developing a system uh, that can actually drill out a femur bone in, uh, in, in legs. And that was hugely advanced of his time. And then he went on to move to back, full circle, back to, to Johns Hopkins, where he founded a major center for surgical robotics there and really built up this field. I mean, I've watched him do this over the course of his career. I mean, the, the part of it I was around for. And I was very lucky to be involved in, I have a paper with him that's yep. uh, called TMG, Robot yep. Motion Planning as a Game with Nature. That's Taylor, Mason, and Goldberg. Yeah. So, um, and I still really, it was one of my fondest memories of interacting with, uh, with, with Russ and, and Matt Mason in a hotel room during ICRA, working on this paper, working out the details. It was so much fun and inspiring. And then the last thing I want to say, and he's won all these awards, they're on the website. He is he is just always a fountain of ideas. And when you're in a meeting and Russ is basically raises his quiet hand and he's always probing, always questions. I've never seen anyone who can ask, well, the only other person who can keep up with him in terms of asking great questions is sitting right here, which is that's Rujana. But he has an amazing ability to really zero in on the key question. And that is a great, great skill. The, 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 the last thing I want to mention is that one day, I, I'll never forget, I was at a conference and I ran into him in a hallway and he said, Ken, you know, there's this problem I'm in looking into, and it's, uh, this has to do with this thing called brachytherapy. And I was like, what? Never heard of it before. And he said, you know, I think it's worth looking into. And I, I remember going back and starting to look up, look it up. And that led to a 20 year, 20 year collaboration with UCSF and a number of papers and, and projects with them. So I want to thank him. I owe him enormously for that. And we are, and I also want to say Russ is a consummate inventor. He is incredibly creative and, and prolific. He has a hundred patents and is a member of the National Academy of Inventors, as well as the National Academy of Engineering and everything else. So I could go on, but I'm going to cut it short. So please join me in welcoming Russ Taylor. Yeah. Well, after that introduction, my head is swelling. <laughs> uh, look, I want to thank you. I, I should say that Taylor Mason and Goldberg is actually one of my favorite papers. And I, uh, looking back, we should have done more about it at that time. Uh, Matt and I had would say to each other, okay, we'll we'll kind of set policy and Ken will make it all work. And that's about the way it worked out. Um, okay, well, thank you very, very much for that kind introduction. Uh, I'll I'll try to uh, <clears throat> leave some time for questions. I, I warn people I haven't actually given this particular talk before. Uh, these are the usual disclosures. So um, moving on, um, just one plug for our lab. Um, we're, we're probably the largest uh, by people certainly, uh, and maybe by funded research center in, uh, in, uh, in the engineering school. Uh, we've got about 250 people overall. We grew out uh, in large part from <coughs> an NSF Engineering Research Center uh, for Computer and Integrated Surgical Systems and Technology. And Regina actually was very helpful in us getting that going. And so thank you, Regina. Uh, the broad research theme of a lot of my work and I think other people at Hopkins really revolves around this three-way picture. We're, 
dealing with a partnership between people, technology, and information to do useful things in the world, to do things that even any two of those together could not do. And uh, today I'm really going to be talking about two use cases. One is what I call computer and integrated interventional medicine, which has really been the main focus of my uh, research for something over 30 years. <clears throat> and also I want to talk about a, a, an ICU project at, and possibly some future directions uh, at, toward the end of, of this talk. Um, if we look at this three-way picture for, for medical robotics, you can use this to give each patient somehow a better intervention. But remember, we've got a computer involved. We know what we did. We can save all of that information. <clears throat> Excuse me. We know the outcome someday. And I ought to be able to relate that information and use machine learning, or I used to call it statistical process control methods to figure out the better way to teach, to treat the next patient. So that's picture right there. It really has been my driving inspiration for about 30 years now. Uh, a key issue here though, more and more, the machines are doing more. They're becoming more autonomous. The key issue is how do I mediate between human intention and physical action in the world. And uh, so I'm, I'm gonna to be touching on that theme uh, for a while. Um, the original, if I look at medical robots, uh, where they really started was around what, what I call surgical CAD CAM, where you typically plan an intervention very, very often based on medical images. You somehow relate all of that information to the physical patient. <clears throat> and then uh, the machine helps you uh, under human supervision to do what was planned to be done and to verify that it was done. So RoboDoc, this uh, first system uh, that I helped develop the prototype of while I was at IBM, uh, I think is a, an excellent early example of that. We were actually started in the late 80s and the first patient was in 1992. Uh, and there's still a lot of research issues uh, moving forward, uh, especially in that, how can we use experience to help us do the next patient better? <laughs> uh, another very early uh, area that we got interested in was basically image guided needle placement. And I'm I think the field it should be grateful that Ken got interested in it uh, early on. And uh, so this has been something, uh, these are examples out of Johns Hopkins. On the right, you see some current work uh, that Yulian Yordikita is doing and it's uh, an MRI compatible robot uh, for spinal injections. <laughs> uh, another, actually the very first medical robots though, didn't touch the patient, they were, uh, E-beam uh, uh, radiation therapy machines. Uh, and these are really robots. They shoot beams of radiation into the patient from all different directions. <clears throat> so you, it adds up typically you want to do something like kill a tumor in where you want to treat and you hope you don't do too much damage in surrounding organs. And the uh, conventional planning process for that is you start with CT, you model things. Uh, to get the beam settings, uh, there's a very difficult optimization problem uh, uh, to meet these constraints. And typically there's a partnership between a dosimetrist who sets up the problem, an optimizer, a very good simulator, a few bad words, and you keep iterating that loop until the uh, physician thinks it's okay to treat. My point here though, is this is highly experience-based procedure. There's some rather crude planning rules uh, about how you can treat individual uh, organs, <clears throat> but it really is experience-based. When do you stop this loop? When do you know how good you can do? And the question we asked ourselves a few years ago was, well, uh, <clears throat> we, we have an experience base. Now there's some thousands of patients in it of everybody we've treated before. This here, you're looking at head and neck cancers. Uh, 
can we use that experience to help us? And one way to do it is if you can go to your database and find a similar patient, which uh, we, we found a way of indexing the database to do that, uh, can you then, if you use the optimization criteria for this other patient who should be at least as hard to treat, but is very similar, uh, sometimes the solution to that will be better than what the uh, dosimetrist came up with in, in terms of formulating the problem. And that could either be used as a quality control check or the other thing we did is we said, well, why don't we just start with that and iterate? And what we found was that in a couple, in a fairly non, non-trivial uh, number of cases, uh, we were able to find a plan that treated the patient, but reduced significantly the dose to surrounding organs, which is a good thing. Um, this has all been patented, licensed, and approved and is in our clinical workflow at Hopkins. But the reason I'm pointing it out is this is, I think, a great example of the value of <clears throat> this experience-based AI machine learning loop beginning to help us treat the next patient better. Well, if I look at uh, robotic surgery, this today is the dominant paradigm. This, I'm showing the da Vinci, but it's basically telesurgery. Uh, <clears throat> you're basically operating uh, your surgical instruments by remote control. And uh, you move a set of handles, the tools kind of mimic your motions, and you can observe it all through stereo video. But everything else is done in the surgeon's head. But uh, well, hey, we got a computer there. And so we, when we began to look at research themes and gradually things are beginning to actually get into clinical practice, <clears throat> you can use the computer to do things like in, improve safety barriers to give the physician more information, uh, make the tool smarter. You can add significant value by taking the advantage of the fact you have a computer there. And so this is uh, some of the research. On the left, you just see one example from like actually a couple of years ago now of one of my PhD students who's now at Intuitive Surgical. Uh, here's uh, another example. Uh, when you're, I, I personally believe that where this partnership is most likely to be, be really adopted first is in assistant tests. Like here, this is retraction. And what we're trying to do is manipulate this liver tissue even while to achieve a particular alignment, even while we're cutting and otherwise modifying the tissue for which we do not have a good uh, finite element model. So this is all done by basically visual servoing. Uh, this is another example. Of more and more people are interested in autonomous uh, suture, anastomosis is stitching things back together. And this is some work uh, uh, led actually by Axel Krieger. He was, uh, I think, at the University of Maryland when this started in DC Children's, but, but he's now a, an assistant professor at Hopkins. And again, uh, there are some specialized tools, a lot of real-time vision and manipulation and uh, eventually we may want, there, there's interest here, also there in Berkeley and a number of other places in more completely automating these sort of procedures. Um, well, there's another paradigm, rather than remote control, uh, there's what I call steady hand control, uh, in which basically uh, the robot works sort of like power steering in a car. The robot and the surgeon hold the tool, the robot, pulls on, you, the surgeon pulls on the tool, the robot feels it and follows the surgeon's hand. But, but because it's a robot doing the motion, there's no hand tremor and you can add value in many of the same ways that you can with that telesurgery. So here's just a couple examples. Uh, here, this is our, 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 we call them our iRobots. They're uh, steady hand, um, manipulators uh, for retinal surgery that uh, we've, a number of us have been involved. Right now, the efforts are at, led by uh, my colleague, Yulian Yordakita. And I just wanna highlight a couple 
themes. One is the use of force sensing. Uh, we've, you're able to build force sensors into the tool and that tells you how hard you're pulling on the tissue. It also tells you uh, the, uh, how hard the, the, the tool is pulling on the sclera. That's the white part of the eye. Uh, here though, uh, well, one of the most difficult aspects in retinal surgery is you're peeling a membrane off the retina and it's very delicate. And if you pull too hard, uh, you can easily tear the retina and that really is a bad thing. Uh, so uh, here, this is the work of a uh, former PhD student, Burke Gonick. Uh, and uh, he, in addition to the force sensing, uh, he also, um, uh, you can use a, um, a three degree of freedom um, a handheld robot, or this whole thing can be put on the on, on, on one of those steady hand robots. But here the question is, uh, how can you feed back information about forces, especially if you're running freehand? Well, one way it, oh, I'm gonna, I forgot to share sound. Uh, just one second here. I need to stop sharing temporarily and I need to reshare and share computer sound. Okay. Uh, so one thing to do is you can play a little tune that corresponds to how hard uh, you're, you're pulling on something. This here, this is just a, a band-aid on a phantom. But there's something else that I think is in, in some ways really cool. Uh, we realize that, that when a surgeon thinks he's pulling too hard, he just lets go and then grasps again. Well, the robot, if it thinks it's getting near excessive force, it can do the same thing. And so it will let go and then it feels it's, and I cut that peel a little too short, but uh, the, this, it, this, I think this sort of simple assistive behavior with some intelligence is one of the places where you're gonna to begin to see more use of uh, semi-autonomy in robots in, in, in the fairly near future. Uh, here's another example. Um, uh, again, uh, this is a bit more recent. Uh, you can use the force sensing to prevent you with two tools, you don't want to stretch the eyeball. And in this case, uh, what's happening is uh, the uh, physician is uh, moving uh, the uh, a tool and uh, the robot is automatically uh, just following the tool with the light source. Uh, here's one more example using those iRobots. Uh, here, um, uh, what we're doing, and again, this is on a phantom, is if you want to make an extremely close up view of the cellular structure in the retina, you can do that with a confocal microscope, but it has a very, very narrow range of motion. Usually to keep you in focus, people will put a little physical spacer, but if you do that on the retina, you'll tear it. So here what we're doing is we're basically using autofocus and the surgeon is guiding uh, the robot uh, in two degrees of freedom across the surface of the retina while the robot is automatically uh, servoing itself in the other direction. So again, this is sort of a hybrid behavior, including some sensor feedback, and in this case, human judgment as to where, where the physician wants to look. There's other aspects I, I don't have time to get into where you can build up little uh, mosaic images and do other things. Um, one other example of this handover, I've done, been doing a lot of work with hand over hand robots uh, for a number of years. Uh, this is uh, a larger system uh, that was developed first by my, uh, well now deceased, my late uh, PhD student, um, Kevin Olds. Uh, but uh, again, it's a hand over hand robot, in this case for head and neck microsurgery. And uh, here, what we've done is we've developed a virtual fixture. So as you push the robot down into the sinus, the robot knows where the walls are and it will kind of steer itself so that you can avoid uh, accidentally colliding with stuff you don't want to damage. Uh, uh, here's another example. This was uh, a former uh, 
uh, student who, who did not finish his PhD, uh, but uh, here again, this is uh, safety barriers in mastoid drilling, um, where uh, here all we're doing is we're trying to very quickly uh, machine out uh, a safe shape. That, and the idea here would be at that point, the master surgeon could get in and begin to use his or her own judgment to do the rest of the procedure. But the other thing that we're working on, I mentioned to Ken before the, the talk is, our goal is to register all of this information to a surgical microscope, keep track of how we're modifying the, uh, the anatomy and then implement and enforce these safety barriers based on the registered CT and real-time tracking of tool to tissue relationships. Uh, one other example uh, from head and neck surgery that is here, uh, what, what the idea is from just a monoscopic uh, video, you can reconstruct uh, a 3D uh, model, uh, dense point cloud model of, in this case, the sinuses. And uh, <clears throat> on the right, you see a visualization of the video from the left but you can also register that back to CT images and use that for your virtual fixtures. And uh, you can begin as well to register uh, what you have uh, to, uh, to a, a statistical model uh, where, you, where you have a number of anatomical labels. And so you can begin to do registration and begin to do much more intelligent um, assisted behaviors. And that where we are, right now is putting the pieces together. Uh, this again is that um, video um, reconstruction of, of the point cloud. It, it, we're somewhat further with this now and are, are doing registrations. The other, the other piece though is uh, you, you would like to be able uh, in, in cases like in a clinic where you don't have uh, a CT scan of the patient, you'd still like to be able to interpret the structures. And so this is some other work uh, from a couple of my uh, graduate students uh, where we are doing deformable statistics-based deformable registration uh, uh, to a statistical model, in this case, of sinus anatomy. So the goal again is to put everything together uh, into a whole picture like that. And we're just getting the bits and pieces of the system together to do that. Uh, one other example uh, of is an ultrasound imaging. Uh, I, th I personally think that robot assisted imaging or robot assisted ultrasound is, uh, <coughs> has a, an enormous potential. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, with Imad Bakhter and a number of our uh, graduate students. Um, one of the most common causes of occupational disability of ultrasonographers is repetitive stress injury. And looking at these pictures, you can tell why. In fact, our, one of our best collaborators had to retire because, because of that. So we've been interested for a number of years <coughs> in again, applying this cooperative uh, a paradigm together here, <coughs> we have a force sensor that limits the force between the, the probe and the robot. And, uh, and you can also do hand over hand guiding. So there are two force sensors here. Uh, and, and you can use this in various ways, autonomously, uh, you can add additional motion to do th things like elastography. I just wanted to talk about one example. Um, here, uh, what we're interested in doing is uh, synthetic aperture ultrasound. Uh, we're looking at a forearm, but where you really care about this kind of thing is in the, uh, in the abdomen. If you have an obese patient and you want to look at something down deep inside that patient, you need to use fairly long wa wavelength ultrasound, but that hurts your, uh, your, your resolution. Unless you have a very wide ultrasound probe, but you don't. I mean, a, a, 
150 millimeter wide ultrasound probe would be very difficult to use. But if you can rigidly keep the ultrasound probe in plane and know exactly how you're moving it, you can do basically synthetic aperture. So here's an example of that from, again, this is a couple of years ago. Uh, we're starting to do more things, but with the coronavirus, it's really hard to get the lab results out. But what you're seeing here is on the right, you're noticing in this case, we're just simply, the image is getting wider. Uh, the really significant thing uh, actually would come from also being able to look deeper. So those are some examples. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, the key issue in all of these, uh, there's technology issues you need, control, better robots, all of those things. But to make this human machine partnership work, you often see many people have written five or enormous, you know, stage one autonomy to stage five autonomy, maybe to stage 32 and a half autonomy. I think that overanalyzes the situation. I was even a co-author on a couple of those, but I think the real key thing are these two, two questions. And if I look at the research issues, how do you interpret human, human intentions? And that involves things like the interfaces. How do you model the task and the environment? How do you describe the task? How do you verify it? And this whole question, how can I share autonomy between a robot and a human? And of course, over on the technology side, uh, well, you've got to be sure that the robot is doing what it, you need to be sure the robot understands what it's supposed to do. And then you got to be sure that it will do that and not something else. So obviously the technology needs to be very robust and reliable. And there's system design, information security issues, improvements in the control. I mean, some of the things that, that, that uh, Ken showed me and just making the control of a Da Vinci more robust, I think are very interesting. Again, uh, you need to understand what you're doing. You need very, very crucially, the computer needs to know when it's got a situation it hasn't seen before. It needs to continually learn and understand, especially with these machine learning methods, when it's in a situation where maybe it hasn't been covered by its training. And then you need ways of safely recovering. So these I think are really important themes. And how do you, and again, this whole question, how do you share control between a human and a computer of a robot? And how do you synthesize all of the sensing and other information are, are I think really crucial enablers. And I, I, again, underlying all of that is really information. Uh, I'd like to shift gears. I, I have other versions of that talk where I have a lot more examples of the kind of thing, but I did want to talk a little bit about um, robotic systems in, in, in our infectious disease crises. Uh, <clears throat> I think for all of us, including, I, I know uh, you folks at Berkeley have also encountered many problems. Robotic system, right now, uh, the, 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 it's getting worse again. We're already up to over a thousand cases a day, uh, one and a quarter million people worldwide, 10 million cases already in the US. We think that robotic systems, all us roboticists leaped into it. There are many things uh, that in principle, a robot could help us deal with some of the challenges. Uh, but there are many, to get there, there are many other challenges uh, that we have to deal with. Um, oh, I left, I accidentally hid. Um, one thing I, I might mention uh, is that we had um, uh, a, uh, a workshop that uh, Ken was one of the, one of the speakers at. Uh, uh, that was jointly sponsored by the National Academy of Engineering and the CCC, which is the Academic Computing Consortium, uh, specifically on, on potential roles for robotics in infectious disease crises. And uh, 
I meant to have up um, uh, the citation uh, for that, but if people are interested, uh, uh, you can find it on, on the web or, you, or email me and I can send you the link. It's also up on, um, <clears throat> on archive. So anyhow, we, we got interested in this problem and uh, uh, one of the one of and uh, at Hopkins uh, we're doing many things. A lot of them are data centric machine learning. Uh, but one of the one of the things was you know uh, clinicians often in ICUs have to go in to make often go into the ICU to just make small adjustments to equipment, in, especially the ventilators. So they'll take a minute and a half or whatever to get all garbed up walk in, spend 15 seconds pushing some buttons, walk out, have to get all gar uh, ungarbed safely, have to have somebody watching them in and out of the room in order to be sure they're doing it right. And so there's an enormous drain on personnel as well as a use of PPE. And so what we realized is, well, that's something a really simple robot could help with. And so this is- Back in March, the Hopkins oh. Laboratory- uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I, uh, Back in March, the Hopkins- oh, uh, And now I've got to do my screen share again, that there is an automatic timer on that that I had thought I got rid of, but I obviously did not. Uh, uh, Okay, uh, here, I need to put that up again. Back in March, the Hopkins. So here, let me do another screen share of this. Screen sharing failed to start, that's bad. Oh dear. Uh, one more time, once more into the breach, dear friends. Okay, uh, here. This laboratory for oh, computational this. sensing and robotics reached out to us and we've been working with Dr. Krieger and his team to come up Absolutely. with this robot what that attaches to the ventilator screen the and it allows us to control the settings on the ventilator from outside the room. This is something that's that's totally new and unique uh, but has a real chance to, to, to make a big difference in healthcare. So a mechanical ventilator breathes for the patient and we can set the exact amount of oxygen we need to, to support their lungs um, beyond the capacity that they can do for themselves when they're very sick. To normally control a ventilator, we have to go in the room with the patient right there. On a normal shift, it wouldn't be uncommon to, to go in six, eight, 10, 12 times in a, in a 12 hour shift or even more, depending on how many settings changes need to be made. So let's say uh, we need to make a quick change on the oxygen percentage for this patient. So instead of going through the whole process of donning and doffing our PPE, we can do that change right on here. I can tap on the screen to have the robot bring the stylus right to where I need it on the screen, and then uh, tap to have it make, uh, make the change for me, all without having to go in the room. We have a little robot finger uh, that is moved uh, in uh, left and right, up and down, and in and out on the screen. So anywhere I can touch on the screen, the robot would go and I can tap uh, on that position and the finger goes in and uh, actuates uh, the uh, ventilator. Having the ability to control this ventilator from outside the room is really valuable. Number one, we can save a lot of PPE. Uh, two, it reduces the risk of... of the yeah, uh, I apologize, uh, but the, the uh, slide accidentally had a timing thing on it, but, but basically I think you got the idea um, I, as I said, there was a team of about eight of us actually, uh, uh, who worked on that, but, and we're still looking for the funding to get it to the next step, uh, which is to be clinically deployable. Given the way, uh, coronavirus is going right now, I think it's something that may be needed, uh. Uh, but also, I, I then got to thinking about where, where ought this really to go? Uh, ultimately, I think some combination of autonomous control, some shared control, teleoperation, I think you can begin to look at a very capable um, robot that is able to work in a, a number of bedside environments. Uh, and I think 
I think there's, for us roboticists, if we thought me medical robotics, so far it's been overwhelmingly uh, uh, surgical with some interest in rehab, but I think there is huge potential in um, bedside care and, and, and hospital operations and things like that. So uh, if you think about what you need, you need hardware, control, intelligence, and deployability. Well, in many ways, the hardware is with us. Uh, these are all robots that have been used. Uh, the, here on the bottom was one that is, they're trying to market for sample tape checking in, uh, in, in, uh, for coronavirus. But there are a number of nursing robots. Most of them have some kind of a mobile base and some level of manipulation capability. And a lot of them are used for simple logistics things or patient handling. Uh, obviously, I think we need to make further advances in sensing dexterity. Uh, but I think the really big issues have to do with cost and reliability of these systems. And even more importantly, uh, control and intelligence. Uh, we can do basic teleoperation, but anything beyond that, um, we're dealing in much less structured environments, in many ways, in, a, in some funny ways, less predictable than what you see in surgery. And uh, I, there are also deployability issues here. And I, I'm, I'm gonna talk a, a bit more about those uh, issues. Um, but again, the key issues are the same here. How do, you, how do you mediate between human intention and action? We can make the hardware better and better. I, there's already capability to do many useful things, but it's to make things versatile here and programmable uh, by people who aren't programmers, I think are major research challenges. Um, so, you know, in thinking about it, uh, this is a, a, a film from the, a clip from the Apollo 13 movie, and I believe the thing on the bottom may actually be Apollo 13. Uh, people are, are amazingly ingenious in using whatever's at hand uh, in an emergency, and we saw that with a lot of things that we did with these robots, uh, primarily repurposing something that was already there or just doing more of it. But, you know, advances in AI should increase these capabilities uh, if, we, if we structure ourselves carefully. Uh, but I think there are really some key challenges. And I want to impose myself for just a moment to preach about what those might be. The first and the obvious one, and probably the one that's most of interest to us researchers as, as academics are the technical capability. Uh, <clears throat> autonomy and intelligent systems. I think we have all these machine learning algorithms, but I think more and more if we're going to trust them, uh, we need to be able to explain, explain them. Again, this whole question of situational awareness, knowing your limits, safe actions in, in situations where, where there may be some uncertainty ways to communicate. Remember, the person doing the programming here won't even be a surgeon. It's typically some, say, um, bedside nurse saying, here I, here I need you to do, to do this, this, and this. Uh, and so the whole question of how a somewhat capable robot can be instructed in what to do and be sure we understand it with a non-expert user is I think really important. Uh, there's some work uh, I, we're seeing there for industrial robots, uh, some work that came out of uh, Hopkins uh, with uh, Kel Gurin uh, in industrial robots that led to a company uh, called Ready Robotics. Um, and again, uh, there are issues still with the hardware and the physical capabilities where obviously better can be done. Uh, systems issues, though, I think really are crucial. Uh, we're dealing, and this is true, I, not only of healthcare robots or bedside robots, but in general, uh, uh, systems, you're putting together complex systems and all of the challenges, especially if you're going to engineer something quickly to get to a deployable state, 
I think we need better ways of doing those things. Uh, I think, uh, again, there's an added challenge of the impact of AI on all of these systems uh, issues. Similarly, testing and verification. And uh, the adequate, do we have, when do we know, do we have the adequate training data or not? And kind of a, it's really almost also a deployability issue of agile and low cost manufacturing, uh, which probably really should, should have gone here. Um, generally, you, you go into a crisis with the robots you have, not the robots you wish you had, as uh, Donald Rumsfeld might have said or should have said. Uh, but that means you need an installed base of systems out there that can be adapted, but, but you can't just build them and put them in a warehouse. They need to have real roles that are economically justified. So that leads to ne us needing to find a strategy for doing that. And again, there's this whole issue of, of training. Uh, and obviously there are issues, uh, regulatory, especially sterility that have to do with the fact that we're working in a medical environment. So uh, that wraps me up and I have 10 minutes left before the end of the hour. Uh, just, I've, I've finished every talk um, actually for over 20 years, for 25 years almost with that picture and it really is to remind us that it isn't about us academics. It's not a, even really about the company. Um, it's about the fact that we're dealing with technology that can really help people in a crisis. And so it ultimately is about the patient and what we can do to, to help the patient. And, uh, and certainly I, I think it was that prospect that, that motivated me to change from, a, I think, fairly successful career in primarily looking at manufacturing applications to begin to look at these medical applications. And uh, I think as advances in robotics and AI are, are really going to create a whole new generation of highly adaptable systems that can implement that three-way partnership to, to both help each individual patient, but also to help us improve for the next patient. Uh, these kinds of systems can you, can, you can give a human surgeon superhuman capabilities. You're in a way coupling human judgment with machine precision and sensing con and control. And uh, also potentially uh, if you have the, the right kind of adaptability, you can respond more quickly to a crisis. And uh, so again, I think the capabilities for, we're seeing research now to do that. And I would challenge us all to figure out how to meet that, those challenges in the future. And that was my last slide, unless you wanna talk about trout fishing. Uh, Ken, I, I will tell you that, <laughs> that uh, when I when I go out and 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 start using some of my discretionary money to to get a robot and build it to do fly casting, you'll you'll begin to think I'm beginning to think about not just me medical robots, but but other things I might want to do. Uh, believe it or not, we have a paper I'm going to send you on on a um, not exactly that fly casting, but related. But um, thank you so much, Russ. This is this is great to hear your perspectives. And I want to give everyone the chance to, to ask questions. I know Rujna probably has a few. One thing I wanted to ask you really quickly is, how do you view the 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 the, the, the advances in deep learning in the con in this context? I, I mean, because of your broad history, I just I think we'd all appreciate hearing from you. What how do you see it? Wow, that's a great question. And I, in a way, I, one answer is I'm of two minds. Uh, I mean, in some ways, the basic ideas have been around, oh, actually, since I was a grad student, but, but obviously improvements in, in particular, there's enough computational capability to begin to train these things. And so it's caused this explosion. And the, the performance you get out of, out of some of these networks is amazing. Um, that said, I, I think there are some, some challenges that we face. I tried to allude to them. 
they primarily these networks are often Hello. really opaque. Yeah, Regina, did you want to type in? Uh, Regina, we're, we're, you're, you're muted. She's on okay. the phone. Oh, maybe. Oh, she was just answering the phone. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so look, um, the, so I think as long as it's not opaque, I, I, the big challenge is the network doesn't know what it doesn't know. And right. if you get a situation that is outside of the training set, and that's actually true of any machine learning based method, the computer needs to know that. Uh, the way we validate these things is we set aside some data and report statistics on how well it did on this other data. But that that's all always bothered me. You know, you say, hey, I'm 95% of the time I'm right, but it would be really nice for the machine to tell you, oh, you know, I'm not so sure that I'm in that 95%. So I, I think these issues of trust are really important. Uh, I also think just a, that some sort of hybrid between more classical methods and, uh, and the uh, deep matter and the machine learning based methods is probably where we need to go. That's a long answer and I apologize for the long winded answer, but. Okay, no, no, that's great. All right, maybe Russ, you could unshare your screen and then we can um, see everybody. And okay, uh, that sounds open it great. Up for questions, great. Regina? You're muted, mute, Regina. You're, you're muted. Oh, okay, got it. It's right. too bad uh, Jerry left. I was going to ask him to comment how he, how he sees us, you know, after, I guess, 60 or almost 70 years. Wow. And the development that he led, actually, you know, the Hendai project that at Stanford. But in any case, my question to Russ is, <clears throat> and the students who are listening wouldn't be surprised, you know, you gave us this wonderful plethora of all these different applications through your life. And of course, that is very admirable. But I am a quintessential professor. And I worry about, I worry about the PhD students. And uh, one of the big problems we have, and as we build these systems, how do you slice it so that there is a foundational question that can be uh, that can be can be defended as a PhD? Oh, that's again, Regina. You always put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> no, that, well, that, those are my concerns, honestly. No, but no, I think it's a, a fair concern. If you're simply doing engineering uh, to build something by itself, that's hard. Although sometimes there is a principle to be gained in developing the in the system. There's a question, I think. <clears throat> that anyone whose major part of his thesis is a system, you'd like to know, well, how does that generalize beyond the application that you gave? But to me, the other key question, I, I personally like having at least one application in mind when you're, you're pursuing, I, I, I mean, it's the Heilmeier questions or as Ralph Gomery, uh, right, who was right. head of research at IBM, you know, he'd come into the lab and say, you know, what are you trying to do? How, how you will you measure success and why does it matter? <clears throat> and I think it's important to know those questions, but usually I, what I, I think the answer is, it, I wanna build a system. Is there something I fundamentally don't know how to do? I need the answer to. Uh, it, mathematical theory, a better way, uh, a barrier, a knowledge barrier that is preventing me from implementing the demonstration. And I, I think it's a fair question to ask the PhD students. Uh, um, I mean, we're not theory people per se, although yes. I, I, I mean, I think the best applied mathematicians would still tell you having some examples. I mean, Polya, who was teaching when we were both at Stanford, right, used, right. To, used to used to harp on that. Yes, yes, so, yes. 
so I, 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 I mean, the home run is something that it's clear that whatever your thesis is, you know how it's going to be useful in some way, but also sort of how well it will generalize. And then, you know, is there something that we didn't know that now that you've done this thesis, we do know? Why is it work? Why does it work? Why, why, do, oh, why, why does it, how does it work? And then why how does, does it work? work? Why does it work? Yeah, yes. those good questions. Yes. But yes. Another one is what do I have to know in order to make it work? That's right, that's right. So, uh, thank but, you. Well, you, I mean, echo. I, think, I mean all, all the people I've, I've talked to in your group and then Ken's and everywhere, that's usually been there is that underneath it, and and I think that's great. And of course, over time, those questions change because we know more. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? I had sort of a related question, actually, sure. um, in terms of you've obviously had this hugely successful and prolific career in, you know, kind of the space that I'm trying to be in, in terms of imaging and control and actually building physical devices with clinical applications. Uh -huh. And I'm curious, you know, how you approach the pro like how you approach collaborations and how you approach finding the right niche for a lot of this research um, when, you know, it's, that's a problem that I deal with all the time is like trying to figure out where to take the deep dive and where yeah. to, you know, consider all of the possible applications and things like that. Sure. No, that, that's, that's a, a good question. Uh, I mean, also your advisor is a pioneer in medical imaging. So you're very lucky there. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you really are, Rushin. Uh, but, but I, I think, Part of my answer is to know what I don't know. And uh, often I, I find myself realizing I don't know much about anything, but, but often seeing how the pieces fit together. The key thing is often, how do you ask the question? But, but as well, um, I've, I've usually not been afraid of collaborating uh, at all. I mean, part of that was, I, I, maybe I went to IBM because that was part of their culture, but it was certainly drummed into me. And then when we moved to Hopkins, um, we formed this enormously successful engineering research center that did help provide an existence proof that that collaborative style of research could be very good both to create a new industry, but also to promote academic careers. I mean, the, the assistant professors who were hired into that became superstars. One was Alison Nakamura, who defected to uh, <laughs> that other place. <laughs> but, but, but I, so I, I, but I, think that, I think that really is the key, is if you focus on the problems and are, don't feel too territorial. And to some extent, you need your advisors to be sure that the graduate students still have some independent piece. And I, I think it's great. Uh, most of my students, uh, I, 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 every one of my PhD students for the last, oh, however many years has been co-advised. And often when you get to their theses, their chapters that came out of collaborations between the students and they just put a footnote that says, you know, I did this piece, this piece, and this piece, and this was my contribution. Uh, Emily did that piece and that piece, and that was her contribution, and together we put it together this way. And at least at Hopkins, that flies fine. Uh, I, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, uh, sure. does that help you? I, I mean, Regina, you've had you you. Yeah, you've had I, a I, I think you, you made the you 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 hit the key. You cannot be if you want to build an atmosphere, a laboratory where these multidimensional problems are solved. You cannot be territorial. You have to sort of be like what the current president elect says. I. I want to be a president for all Americans. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to be just for my students. I want to facilitate environment so that everybody kind of shines. And um, that takes certain personalities and who just don't push their ego so much. And, and 
allow the students to shine perhaps even more than the professor? Yeah, I, 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 I'm probably true that a lot of my students are smarter than I am. Yes. Uh, I mean, also some of the other people I've worked with, like Dr. Goldberg here. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I, I, I mean, so again, that, that you know, maybe maybe us folks who are maybe nearer the ends of our career, uh, yes, can look back and 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 be more curmudgeonly or more reflective. But it really is true. Uh, people who get perceived as being for themselves alone will quickly hit a wall in this new environment. Yes, I agree. All right. Well, also, any, any would, other students, please speak up. Don't, gonna, don't, I, don't let the professors to talk. <laughs> I just want to add, and I have to go to the to to speak of which uh, our lab meeting. But I, I do want to say, actually, I've been realizing lately that. In some sense, I feel like I'm a coach or conductor more yes. and more. Yes. And part of what our job is that I have, the students are athletically far better than me. And, and so I am not gonna, it's not like, you know, I'm the one to throw that touchdown. I can't do that anymore. And so yes. I, I'm like, but what I can do is help them really be the best they can, they can do, mm -hmm. they can be. And so that, that, I enjoy that. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're actually in the same, very same position, yes. but I want to say on my side, I appreciate so much both of you being mentors in my life at a very important stage that really, really helped me to to get to this point. You both inspired me so much, so thank you. Well, thank you for that. It's a mutual admiration society. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right, but I'm going to take off. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay, right. Ken. Thank Bye you, guys. So, okay. any I, other I students until people, as long as people want. Uh, are there other questions or is everybody just giving up? Uh, um, well, I can, I guess, <laughs> just add a little bit to what I asked before in terms of like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I certainly aspire to that level of like collaborative spirit. Um, but I think it's also hard, it's kind of overwhelming to look at, you know, breaking into like the medical community and to find those people who are first adopters or to find like those collaborations that are really gonna be fruitful and like, good for everyone. So I'm curious yeah. what you look for in terms of those. Well, the first thing to realize if you're gonna work with surgeons or probably any physicians is they have big egos. That's what I hear from my and medical friends. Learn to, well, look, to do what they do, they have to have big egos. Gonna cut somebody's brain open. And the, the key is to find collaborators on the user community who may have big egos, but can somehow contain it or at right. least Respect <laughs> what you're doing. I mean, yeah. uh, you made some similar points a long time ago to me, Regina. So, um, I, I, I think, you know, it's hard. I, one of the things I think that to me has been really helpful again is to, I, I usually try to start with what is the need. What is it that I want to get something to do? What is the problem I want to solve? I. I, my own way of thinking uh, about the world is I think more like an engineer than a scientist, although I hope I'm a little bit of both, in that I, I, I want to solve a problem. I want to, and then I, I'm of, often curious to get knowledge, but a, a lot of it is to identify, sometimes I'll just go explore something so it seems cool and interesting. And, having the ability to do some play is really important. But I think that, I don't know, Regina, how you would put it, but. No, uh, I, I very much resonates to what you are saying. And, you know, different people have different um, skills and inclinations. Yeah. And, and um, even in, <clears throat> if you just do pure robotics, not even applications, you have more who like to um, abstraction and, and, and think about the differential equations and stability and convergence and all this, the good stuff that the theoreticians do and they prove theorems. And then uh, the, the others, you know, take some of these models and try to, uh, map into those um, uh, U's and X's and Y's and so forth, <laughs> some some numbers and and so so anyway, 
I, I don't want to go on. Yeah, no, I, the fact no. is that, you know, we all have different skills and what I think, what I think uh, for people like Laura and, and, and the students who are starting their career, the difficulty for them is that if, unless they join a big lab, which has all the facilities, what they will have to face is to be patient and build the, the lab <clears throat> over, let's say, five years or so, by little by little increasing the scope of the problems that they can ask. Because if you just work by yourself with two students, you can ask some interesting questions, but they are narrow. On the other hand, if you <clears throat> if you happen to join the lab like uh, like you have uh, Russ, then uh, you know there, there's a lot of equipment, but then you also pay the price for it that you have to sort of adjust to the current environment. Mm -hmm. You cannot start your own. Yeah, although uh, if you, you can find an environment, I, I'd like to think it's ours that is supported and, and, and encourages people to, in fact, it, at Hopkins, just as at Berkeley, to get tenure, you've got to make an independent success. That's true. But, true. but one of the things that often starting faculty will be be invited to be co-investigators in some things, and some of that is the financials feed your right, students right, and so right. forth. The other part of it is learning how to write a proposal. Yes. It's something I did not really know when I, that 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 ERC proposal, Regina, was the first. I know, I remember. Proposal that I ever written. Well. Yes, I yes, yes, uh, yes. But, but you can also have, be at different points on that continuum. Uh, this guy, Noah Cowan, I mentioned to you uh, earlier, um, He's a great engineer, but he thinks much more like a scientist. The mm. questions that he interests him most right, I think, right, are understanding right. how biological mechanisms mm -hmm. control themselves. Right. Now he'll he'll have to solve very hard engineering problems to get those answers. Mm -hmm. uh, but in his case, I, I I and I've we've often had this conversation because it, it isn't true. as cut and dried or as as I'm making out, uh, right. but, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm more interested. I want to, I want to build a machine that helps treat patients. And to do that, I need to understand some things. Right. Right. And I, I, I need to learn some basic principles so that anything yes. I do generalizes. Yes. But, but there are a lot of people in between who are in multiple places along that, that it's continuum. Different. And you've got to, you've got to, Probably the key thing is to find an environment that will be supportive enough yes, that, that you can build what you're doing, but want just simply yes. treat you yes. as a, as sort of a cog in a machine. Right, right, right. Okay. So, any other students? Any other questions from students? Uh, yeah. I see a few. Hmm. Maybe. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Okay. I, I can go listening. ahead and uh, stop the recording. So, if anyone wants to. Uh, ask off the record questions. Oh, of the, of Bye the. everyone. <laughs>